and welcome to Life Colors, the revolutionary way to reverse, improve, or prevent all the common lifestyle illnesses. Today, we're going to be looking at the world's biggest killer, that's heart disease, our orange life color. Hello, and today we're looking at the orange life color, which is heart disease. Heart disease is one of the biggest killers in the Western world today. It kills, in Britain, about 200,000 people every year, and nearly one million deaths in the United States every year is down to heart disease. In fact, 47% of all deaths that occur prematurely in the Western world are down to cardiovascular disease of some kind. Heart disease actually costs Britain alone 20 billion pounds every year. Now the question has to be, what causes heart disease and what is it? When you look at these two arteries, you can see a beautiful, clean, pristine artery and next to it you have the artery that is filled with plaque. That means that the blood has to travel through this narrow entry rather than this nice fat space. Now organs don't like the fact that there's not enough blood going to it, so they will make your body push up your blood pressure so that more blood can get through this narrow space. This raise in blood pressure will cause even more problems, as you'll discover in the red life color. Now when I was at school, or medical school, there was no way you could get out of medical school without understanding the first signs of heart disease, and more specifically, the first signs of a heart attack. Somebody having a heart attack would have tight chest pain, they'd be feeling hot and sweaty, sometimes they feel quite n nauseous, and often that pain will radiate down into their arm and up into their neck and jaw. But I put it to you that before any of that happens, Many people have already the first signs of heart disease. Well, this gentleman's known to many of us, Homer Simpson, and I believe that if you live a life like him, you already have the first signs of heart disease. What do I mean? If you're inactive, if you have a poor diet, if you're stressed out all the time, and if you're overweight, smoking and drinking, all of those things or a combination of them will lead to you having already the first signs of heart disease. Many of you would have heard of the Vietnam War. The average age of the soldiers in Vietnam was 19. And the tragedy was that when those soldiers were killed in Vietnam and brought back to the United States, some of the autopsies revealed that they already had massive heart disease at the age of 19. How did they get that? Well, it was lifestyle. I'd like to introduce you to a scientist and doctor who really changed my way of thinking. You see, many years ago, I used to train as a surgeon. And I was one day operating on somebody who had severe heart disease. But several months later, that gentleman had to come back to have another operation because his arteries had furred up again. And my professor was sitting next to me, and he was actually too unwell to have another operation. So he asked us, well, what then can I do? And my professor, who was one of the best minds in cardiothoracic surgery, could only offer him, well, absolutely nothing. He said, there is nothing we can do. That gentleman went home to die. At that point, I figured to myself, there must be something more that we can do for people like this. So I spent a lot of time researching and traveling, and I discovered that there are lots of doctors already doing things to reverse heart disease. And this experiment demonstrates that perfectly. 
At the Cleveland Clinic, Esselstein Caldwell took 18 of his severe heart disease patients, people who could really not, not even walk 10 meters before they got chest pain, and he took them under his wing. When you total the number of cardiac events that they had eight years before the experiment, they came to 49. And a cardiac event could mean a heart attack, chest pain, stroke. All he did was change their diet. He put them on a plant-based whole grain diet, a diet that was low in fat, that was low in sugar, and that was low in salt. Very important that he left out much of the oils, even the so-called good oils. Well, what did he find? Within weeks, their cholesterols were halved. And pretty soon after that, all of the chest pain went away. In fact, for 11 years after the experiment, none of those individuals had any cardiovascular events at all. That is remarkable. But even more remarkable, was that over 70% of those patients had a dramatic reversal of their heart disease. Let me show you what I mean. Here on the left, you can see the critical narrowing of an artery. This is what happens when the artery gets furred up with cholesterol, and as I demonstrated before, the blood has to go through a much narrower point. Somebody in this condition would be having chest pain walking even short distances. Here is the after angiogram on the very same patient. Now, if I was back in the hospital and I had finished an operation and I had a result like this, everybody would say, you've done a fantastic job. But actually, this individual had no operation at all. All they did was change their diet. This is fantastic news. Because all around the world, doctors are being told that once you have heart disease, it's permanent and you have to put a stent in. If the stent doesn't work, you have to have an open bypass surgery. But what has been discovered and what is being practiced in many parts of the world today is that a change in lifestyle can reverse the heart disease completely. Many people ask me, well, I thought it was all in the genes. In fact, there was one day I was working in an accident and emergency department, and I had seen a gentleman who had actually survived a heart attack the night before. He was sitting by his bed, and beside his bed were three packets of cigarettes. And I said to him, well, are you keeping those as a memento? I mean, you're not going to be smoking anymore, are you? He said, yeah, of course I'm going to be smoking. I'm going out for a smoke right now. I said, but uh, you've just got over a heart attack. You're lucky to be alive. Don't you think you should stop smoking now? He said, why would I do that? I said, well, by changing your lifestyle, you can reduce the risk of getting another heart attack. And he said, no, doctor, none of that. You see, I can tell you why I had a heart attack. I said, why? He said, I had a heart attack because my father had a heart attack. And he had a heart attack because his father had a heart attack. I was always going to have a heart attack. It's just in the genes. And that's what many people believe. They believe that they can blame their parents for their illness. And I always say, if there's one thing you learn from the Garden of Eden, it's not to blame somebody else. You remember the story. God blamed Adam. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. And the serpent, of course, didn't have a leg to stand on. So going back to heart disease, the reason why this all clogged up for him was because of his lifestyle. He smoked, he drank, he ate lots of fatty foods. You, may, you have to ask, though, why should smoking actually cause heart disease? Why should blood pressure cause heart disease? The reason is that when you have high blood pressure, your arteries expand more. And as they expand more, they cause little tears in the lumen of the arteries. So this beautiful looking artery transforms into that artery because there are slight tears in the lumen of the artery. As that tear gets to be repaired by the body,
the body lays down some fat. Now that fat oxidizes, and then more fat and more cholesterol gets piled on top. And it's a bit like putting a Band-Aid on a cut, and then putting another one on top, and then another one on top. It just becomes cumbersome, and it then ends up blocking that artery. Also, cholesterol. High cholesterol, especially the low-density lipoprotein, is a great indicator that you are going to have heart disease. And low-density lipoproteins we get in our diet. We eat them. So if you have high amounts of fat or sugar, because sugar is converted into cholesterol, you will end up having high LDL, high cholesterol. Many people who say to me, well, I've been a vegan all my life. I don't eat any cholesterol. How is it that my cholesterol is so high? Well, it gets high because your sugar gets converted into fat or even your vegetable oils get converted into fat, gets converted into cholesterol. The, the thing you must do is avoid smoking. Smoking is always bad for your body, and it makes you at a, such a high risk of heart disease. Now, the purple and blue life colors stand for diabetes and obesity, and they are both implicated in heart disease as well. High levels of blood sugar rapidly increase your risk of heart disease. Sugar in the blood tends to narrow the arteries. Sugar also increases the amount of insulin in your body, and insulin will cause your arteries to grow, to become hypertrophied. And that means that they will narrow the opening through which blood can flow. By avoiding exercise, you will actually increase your risk of heart disease. Most people understand that the more activity you do, the more calories you burn, the lower your risk of heart disease. And also stress. Stress is a factor in actually every life color, and you cannot exclude it in heart disease. The stress or black life color leads to the arteries narrowing artificially, and that means that your blood pressure will also rise. The reason why that happens also is because, not because of the environment that we're in, but it's how we deal with the environment. You can have two people in the same so-called stressful situation. One will be stressed, the other one will be at peace, and it's down to their personality and their thoughts. Research has shown us that if you have a type A personality, a determined go-getter, perfectionist type personality, that can predispose you to heart disease. But it's not that part of the personality that's dangerous. The part that is really dangerous is the hostility that goes with um, that person. Good evening, good evening. To finish it, we come back tomorrow. So this is something to bring you back, to finish the um, thing. Let us um, stand for a prayer. Word of prayer. Loving and most merciful Father, we want to thank you, even for the Son. We want to thank you for traveling mercies. Lord, and if we have misrepresented you in any way throughout the day, we ask for your forgiveness. We pray for those that are coming, hasten their footsteps. As we commence. Day three, we ask you to be with us, I pray. Be with the presenter. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. Good evening. <laughs> right, I was just asking my daughter to greet people, and she said, You. I'm saying, You. She said, You. 
So, how was your day? Sunny. Yeah, okay. We, we had promised to sing today, but some members of my family are not here. They're almost. So, they'll, they'll catch us on the way. Maybe, Sister Charmaine, can you join us? Once you see them walking in, you disappear. So the first song that we are going to sing is 493. Uh, for our visitors, if 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 you've got a if you can if you can share the hymn with our visitor, because we are not we are not displaying the words. Like he, he lives. Our Lord lives, isn't it? Ah, he does live, yes. I see his hand of mercy. 
message from our speaker. Um, I just like to welcome you all and I'm glad you're here and I hope that as you are, as you listen to the message tonight you will be blessed 
you will learn something, your faith will be strengthened and uh, you have a closer walk with God. Now, um, any visitors? I can see one visitor over there. Any visitors? Um, any other visitors? No? Okay, um, we're going to ask uh, the usher to. Welcome, my brother, and I hope you will be blessed as you read our little booklet. Okay, um, as we, all oh right, we are starting um, quite early, um, but again, I think the earlier we start, then the earlier we'll be able to leave here. Uh, let us stand forward. Our Father and our God, we are indeed grateful that you have brought us here to hear another dropping of your word. Lord, when we look around us, we could be anywhere. So many things are happening out there, but Lord, you have brought us here. May you continue to be with us, teach us your truth through your manservant, and enable him, Lord, to bring that message that we so desperately need, that message that will strength, help us to strengthen our walk with you. Because, Lord, we know you're coming soon, and we know that you're coming for a prepared people. Help us, therefore, Lord, that the words that we hear that we may not keep it to ourselves, but we may share it with those with whom we are able to. We pray for the pastor, that you will be with him, and the word that he speaks, Lord, that it may come directly from your throne. Be with us all. Give us an attentive he ear, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Our theme song 522, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Trust as well as friend, but 
sinking sand. He saw this covenant and blood support me. working it is thank you it's such a privilege to be here with you once more I was facing this way I did not see the friend who is here like me you don't normally worship here and like me you have been invited like me and you are here I feel I have a friend because otherwise I would have been the odd one out <laughs> so I was facing this way I just want do you know when you are among strangers and um, sometimes you get overwhelmed when you look at um, um, in, um, in some places they are called one talks in Papua New Guinea they speak what is called pitched in English so when they say you are my one talk they actually mean you are my one talk. We speak the same language. So I'm sort of trying to find out who is my one talk so that when I get overwhelmed, I just look at their face and we have the, you know, the familiar look. And then I know we are together. I didn't see I was facing this way. Uh, I just wanted to say a special blessing. I heard he was somewhere here, the friend who is here for the first time. Oh, thank you. Blessings to you. Blessings to you. Uh, anyone else who has been invited here, they are here for the first time, you are just like me. You have been invited. You don't normally worship here, um, and you came. Just raise your hand if you are here. Okay? All right. Anyway, we thank the Lord for the time we are going to spend together. Just to recap a little bit so that you see the map um, the presentations have not just been random. There is a, a pattern we are following, and they are all based on Revelation chapter chapter 12, and the verse is... So let's read the text, and then uh, let's see uh, the pattern that we are following. The text says, And a war broke out in heaven... Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail. I'm reading on to verse 8 now. 
but they did, not, they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, the, the pattern we are following is, on Saturday, what, we, what they call here the Sabbath, uh, morning, we looked at, at the principles behind the war, the, the, the ammunition that is behind this war. We saw that on one side, on the side of goodness. This is the war between good and evil. On the side of goodness, could you just recount with me? Kindness, gentleness, patience, selflessness, meekness, humility, all those virtues are actually not points of weaknesses. In this world, uh, I see a familiar face here. In this world, these virtues can be looked, as, looked at as being weak. Someone who is humble, someone who is selfless, someone who is submissive, is normally looked at as a person who is weak. Um, but we are discovering in this process that actually those are powerful guns to win the war. And please do not lose, lose that thought. And on the side of evil, we saw that what? Meanness, selfishness, Self-centeredness, pride, violence, aggression, all those are powerful tools that the devil is using on his side. Christianity properly done, since this week we are looking at the core of Adventism, um, Christianity properly done we are not supposed to use the tools of the devil to fight our war. At home, with those people we love. Don't you sometimes get surprised that it is those people we love the most that we tend to hurt the most? Because it's very easy to come to church and be gentle and nice and kind and sweet. Almost as if we live a double life when we go back home, there is another monster. Our elder, I was at a place where a man was preaching a powerful sermon. I was sitting there in the pews and I was like, wow, this message is for me. The Holy Spirit is here. And I was sitting on the edge of my seat as the man of God was moving with the message. But there was a woman who kept on disturbing me, behind me. She kept on making these hissing, hissing noises, like she was a snake of some kind. And she kept on making these, mm, as if she was dissatisfied. To some point, at some point in time, I was almost judgmental thinking, this must be a devil's implant in the church. As we were going out, I wanted to find out who this lady was and what was going on for her. And I said, ma'am, how are you? How did you find the sermon? Oh, the first sermon was, you know how we put on a face? The sermon was fine. It was my husband preaching. And the context began to come together. It's very easy to be sweet to strangers. You know how at work, when there is a lady that is walking behind you, you actually open the door for them and let them, 
And you are such a gentleman, but never do it to your wife. And I'm not saying it's, it's wrong to be nice to strangers. I'm just saying the tools with which we can do. There is no weakness at all in being sweet to other people. You know, we, we, we have this thing that we have just started this year at our church, that we, our goal as men is to raise a generation of men that are safe. Healthy men, psychologically. And we, we are trying to provide a space. I don't know whether we're going, we going to be successful or not, but it is, it is, the, it is a journey that we're going through as a church that we want to embody these, these virtues, these values that are tools and win our marriages back. We, we cannot win them back if we continue to use the devil's weapons. We will only destroy them. We, we are beginning to rediscover what it means when the Bible says we are the heads of our homes. Because we have discovered that even though we are the heads, the ladies are the caps on the head. So, we then moved on in the afternoon to look at the principle of evil. I don't know whether you were with me in the afternoon. At, um, it's a question that we all have to ask we, whichever worldview you have. This evil, it is there because this world, for some reason we have chosen to shut God out of this world and evil happens and we blame it on him. For some reason we do that. Yet the honest truth, my friends, is we have, we have cast our vote with the devil. Since Eden, we have repeatedly done that. And next week, next week we will see how we have repeatedly done that. And God is standing there and saying, can't you see the government you have voted for? And I mean spiritually here. I don't want to, be get, I don't want to get kicked out of out of." out of England. The government that you have chosen of the devil is causing all this evil. I'm here. Choose me and leave. Then we moved on. Yesterday, we saw the war that started in heaven, how it came down on earth and affected humanity. That we began to be the the, the target, even from birth. Now, today, the idea, the objective is to see that the target, this battle, is not just on earth. Yesterday, right? See this again. First time, the battle was in heaven. Yesterday, the battle came down to earth. Today, I, if we are successful in our task, we should be able to see that the battle is actually targeting our minds. That is if we are successful. So you pray for me as I pray for you. So that was last, last night's presentation, Born Identity. Tonight we are looking at a title that says, The Thief Cometh to Steal. The thief cometh to steal. And John chapter 10 and the verses 10 is our theme text. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they might have what? And they might have it more abundantly. And this is what we want to look at. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we pray to acknowledge the presence of the Holy Spirit. He has been waiting here, so we enter into his presence. And dear Lord Jesus, help me in your name. Amen. 
I want us to look at these three texts in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 12 to 15. This is almost all we have to look at, these three verses. If you have them, please open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. The verse is 12. If you are there, please say amen. All right. Chapter, 12, chapter 3 and the verse is 12. Not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on toward Sorry, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 15 is my darling text. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God reveal this to you. May God bless the reading of his word. The ID in Australia, I had to make that up because I don't have one, would look something like that. Um, if it was mine, it would have looked like that is Photoshop. But it would have looked something like that. You see how handsome the picture is? Like Denzel Washington. I intend for us to see that the thief came and stole And the picture got distorted. But let's look at this text here. We're looking at it from a different version. Not that I have already obtained or have already been made perfect, but I do what? so that I may lay hold. I misread this text for many years. So I want you to come with me on a journey. So that I may lay hold. It is that which I am laying hold of that I'm inviting you to see. And if we can see that tonight, we are finished. Here is what I'm getting, what I'm getting hold of, what I'm supposed to be apprehending tonight. I am not, I used to think it says I am getting hold of that which Christ got hold of. How many of you thought like me? That's, that, that's what it means. Christ got hold of me and he's inviting me to come and get hold of it. No, the text is not saying that. That's what I used to read in the text. But listen to it now, carefully. So that I also may lay hold that for which also I was laid hold on by Christ Jesus. Is it making sense? All right. Let's try and have it make sense. What did we say yesterday? We are clagers. But we managed to see that we are just no more clay jars. For now, the devil has dealt us with a golf ball. You remember the story of the golf ball? We are now shattered clay jars. We are now shattered clay jars. And because of that, we, the ID has been distorted. That's what we are now is not what we were created for. 
That was not the purpose for which God created us. Let me, let me put it in more plain terms. In the beginning when God created, he said, let us make man in our what? After our... Now we see in chapter 5 that when, when, when um, Adam is procreating, he procreates in what? Which means the image is no more as handsome as we started off with. And I want to put it to you that it's not just the image, but it is the purpose and the meaning of life that has been what? Distorted. Now men and women live to satisfy self. Can I get a little bit deeper here so that you understand where we are coming from? For five days, God would create and he would take a step back and he would look at his creation and he would exclaim at the end of every day and say what? Behold, it is good. But on the sixth day, God was heard exclaiming differently. Uh -huh. It is not good for men to be alone. You are with me, church? Was it because Adam's nose were in a different place? The reason is, Adam did not reflect on his, by himself. He did not reflect the image of God. Mm. All right, pastor, I'm getting into trouble. What did God say? Let Can Adam say, let us? So he does not reflect the image of God because God is a community. Oh, yay. When he speaks, he says, let us. So he's a community. But Adam is all alone. Alone is a compacted English word that stems from all one. He is alone. He does not reflect the plurality of God. Now, the, the, the proper way of putting it is that, of putting the plurality of God is that God is a community. He cannot be love if he is the object of worship all one alone. But if he submits amongst himself in a community, then he truly can be loved. How do we know that a young man can really love? Not when he is all one. Young people, are you with me now? I'm walking down your street. All one. It's not possible. So God is a community, number one. Number two, God is a creative community. So God's image should be a procreative community. Stay with me, church. For this reason, God did not create Steve for Adam. I'm just letting it. Because God intended, now, please do not hear in this statement judgment and censure, because there is none. There is totally none in my statement when I said God created Steve for Adam. There is no judgment there for those of alternative lifestyles. There is no judgment whatsoever in that. Because once we assume judgment, we have left the tools of God. So stay with me, church. Stay with me. So, it is the devil's desire to come to this image of God and distort it. Now, today we are focusing on how he does that on an individual. Paul, 
in Philippians chapter 3 starts by mentioning his own distorted identity. Now, this may come to you as a shock. But Paul starts by denouncing his false identity. Ooh, I'm in trouble. Here I'm sensing I'm getting into trouble. But I'll say it anyhow because it's the truth. Paul says, I was circumcised. An Israelite. A tribe of Benjamin. Hebrew of Hebrews. A Pharisee. Blameless only in the flesh. And he says, all of this is my fleshly identity. Then Paul says, because this is my fleshly identity, my superior being is in my spirit. Mm. I have considered all that I used to consider gain, now I consider it loss. Do you know what sometimes distorts the community that God wants us to be in? It's my sense of false identity. I am male. I am an African male. I am a Zimbabwean male. That's my identity. So this creates a them and us attitude. So we begin to divide ourselves by our ethnic identities. That's not the purpose for which God created us. Because now we are living for self. I know society and the trends of history have entrenched us on an identity and a purpose for which God never intended for us. Stay with me, church. Paul is denouncing it now. That's where he begins before he comes to chapter, to verse 12. Do I sense some uneasiness now? Pray for me. In the letter to the Philippians, 16 times the book mentions the word mind. The word mind. As if Paul is drawing us, I don't have time, Pastor, to get into this. As if Paul is drawing us to, to, to the avenues to the mind that need to be guarded in the sense of false identity in our minds. So that we can have a true identity. Then we can go and save others. We can be truly selfless. We can be truly selfless. I looked at that, that we are clay. Let's look at, again at, at, at Philippians chapter 3 verse 12. This is retranslated now. It says, not that I have received it or already have been made to be perfect. Instead, what do I do? I am pursuing that I may also get hold. Listen to that now. Get hold of the what? Of the purpose for which Christ Jesus has received me. What is the purpose for which I was received by Christ? Paul is surprising here. I, I would have been comfortable with Paul saying the purpose for which I was created. Right? But then Paul says, no. I can't say that because the purpose for which I was created was distorted in Genesis chapter 3. You are with me now? So Paul says, I can't talk about that. I know by birth, our ID, the image of God has been what? Distorted. Now, Christ without any of us persuading him ran right ahead of all the human race and went to the cross and got hold of the purpose. You are with me now? 
without any persuasion from us. And Christ does this right from Eden. Stay with me now. Here's the point. In Eden, who got lost? Adam and Eve. Who looked for who? This has been God's business from Eden chasing after humanity. It has never been humanity looking for God. Is God calling out, Adam, Adam, where are you? So I, 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 say, I say to people in worship, I've stopped praying, Father, send down your Holy Spirit. We need a proper, what do you call it? Praise and worship for the Holy Spirit to come. So we are chasing after God now. No. The Holy Spirit has already been here waiting. Chasing after us. No, no, no. He does not have to wait for us to be cleaned up. For him to show up. We are now getting into a prayer, but let's start by praying and confessing our sins so that God can show up. No, 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 no. He has been there in the prayer band room waiting for sinners. So better sinners come into the room and say, Father, we acknowledge your presence. We know there is nothing we have to do for you to show up. All we have to do is be sinners and then you come up. For there is something in the heart of God that is just drawn to sinners. This is why we can never in a, be in a place of judgment. Did I tell you to suspend your judgment? That is why we can never be in a place of judgment. Because the most broken people... Let me ask you, friends. I'm off the script now, but let me ask you a question. Where is the holy shrine for Christianity? I know where the holy shrine for Islam is. I know where it is. They go there on pilgrimage every now and then. I know where the holy shrine for Catholicism is, and I don't say that with any measure of judgment. Just in December, we were there in the Vatican. We saw people coming. They find meaning in that. They go there because they find a holy shrine there, the relics of Peter. Are they? They find meaning in that. Some go to that river in India, they find meaning that those are holy shrines. Where is the holy shrine for Christianity? No, no, not in Jerusalem. That grave is empty. There's nothing in there. If you want to visit Jerusalem, it's not for religious purposes. You're just a tourist. So where is the holy shrine? Where is the burning bush now? God lingers, my friends, let me submit to you this evening. God lingers around the suffering of men. God lingers around the brokenness of people. You want a holy shrine for Christianity? Look for where people are suffering. God is right there. Better take off your shoes when you see a single lady who is struggling to make a life. Better take off your shoes. You are standing on holy ground. There is nothing we can do to bring God down. He says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where, which house could you build for me? For me to be present. He's just present. When we are broken and heavy laden in sin, he just shows up. So, understand this. Let's go back to the text now. With that in mind, he says, Christ has already laid hold of us. Everyone. So what is the journey? The journey is for me now. My struggle in my mind is to understand why Jesus is so loving to me. That's what Paul is talking about. So the starting point for me as a red, as a hot-blooded heterosexual African men or someone else with 
a, an alternative lifestyle, the starting point, the ground is level. You are not with me, church. The ground is what? I am no better than him. Jesus even made it more plain and even made it more precarious. He says, if you look at a woman in last year, where do I get the guts to then point my fingers at someone else with an alternative lifestyle? You are with me now? So let's move on. Let's move on. There is the word pursue. I wanted a, a visual image of pursuing. So I found that on the internet. Do you see the man who is pursuing? It's serious business. There must be something that man in front has that belongs to the guy who's behind. I was, I was working in a city back home. Um, I was in the third floor. I was in marketing. So I would, every now and then, I would be talking to people on the phone for hours on end. Minutes, 30 minutes, I'm talking to a client. So what I used to do is I would go and stand on the window in the third floor. And I'll be looking down in the street and just seeing people. It was a habit of my people that are passing by. And I'm talking to my client, trying to convince them to buy my, my, my products. And I used to do that quite a lot. One day, I'm standing up there. Now, on the other side of the street, I can see a pickpocket. You know, sometimes in Africa, um, some of the cities are not called Nairobi. They're called Nairobi. <laughs> I can see a pickpocket right across the street. I'm, I'm feeling helpless because I can see him trying to lift something. There's a gentleman who's well-dressed, he's got a briefcase, and he's walking down the street, and this pickpocket, he's, he's walking beside, pretending he's just walking by the side, but I can see his end, but I'm on the third floor, and there's a window that cannot open up. You know how they seal them up? I'm just looking at him, and I'm thinking, I'm feeling so helpless, what can I do? And I'm even saying to my client, you know what, I'm looking at a person who is getting robbed and I'm feeling helpless. And then he gets to the traffic light and he's stopped by the traffic light. By the traffic light, a lot of people come and I can see that there is a bit of uh, people pushing together. And eventually, as the, as the traffic light opens up, he pulls up what I thought was a wallet. I was too far off to see what exactly it was that was pulled out of the pocket. I assumed it was a wallet. That thing, that black thing comes out. He gets hold of it. He turns around just in time for the man to feel that there is some weight that has come out of my back pocket. And he realizes at that point that he has just been. So he turns around. He sees the man walking away. And I can see his mouth opening. I cannot hear what he's saying. I assume he's saying, thief. And that man takes off. And I see the man, at this point in time, he forgets that he's a gentleman with a jacket on. He is now what? No, I, the word, remember? Pursuing. Because in the wallet, there is his ID. Now, I now live in Australia. I see a different delivery system of these um, services, government services. If I lose my, my license, I just go to this road traffic authority thing, and I just tell them that I've lost my license. So I stand there, let's take a picture of you, and then they take a picture of me. Within two seconds, I have an, another license, and I walk away. Not in some of the African countries. You lose your ID, it's going to take you years. So if it's stolen, you better run. You better pursue. You better pursue.
This word pursue, it means to move rapidly and decisively towards an objective. To follow in haste in order to find something. Now, which word keeps coming up in the book of Philippians, by the way? So this is not a process of works, lest it be righteousness by works. This is a process of the mind. Are you with me? Because the stolen ID is right here. You better close the avenues to the mind because the devil wants to steal your mind. You better be careful what you do with this. We have a young man in Australia. The mother used to talk to us saying he's a straight A student. Until he passed his O levels, equivalent of, he's in studying for his A levels. Then he starts playing around with boys, and this is how he starts, elder. He starts by playing video games late into the night in his bedroom. So he goes to sleep at 4 a.m., but he has to be in class at what time? So for him to stay awake, he needed energy drink. He doesn't know that he has started a journey and opened up the avenues to the mind. This is a brilliant young man with all the future, a brilliant future ahead of him. Now, after some time of energy drink, that energy drink is not working anymore. He needs something stronger. So he goes for something with more caffeine. But he's wearing off now. He needs something stronger. And stronger. And stronger. Before he knows it, the purpose for which he was created for, both temporary and eternal, both for this world and for the world to come, they are beginning to fade before him, fade away before him. The devil is stealing the idea. I've just told you the story of the pickpocket, so we can skip that. Now, the image used to look like that. Denzel Washington, hello. But when the devil has stolen your ID, he doesn't leave it like that. He distorts the handsomeness gone. And I mean in a figurative sense now. The purpose for which someone was created for is what? Gone just like mist. My friends, the devil is not a friend to play around with. <laughs> they came to Jesus and he says, look, what shall we do with taxes? Should we give to Caesar? And they were tricking him and Jesus says, hey, bring a coin here. This is quite interesting. This narrative, it blows me away all the time. Jesus says, bring me a coin. Whose image is this? And whose inscription is it? And they say, Caesar's. And then Jesus says, so give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Dumb people. You should have then asked. Now that you have said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And to God what belongs to Caesar. Where is the inscription and the image of God so that we can give that to him? Ah, uh, you're not with me. If the coin 
has the image of Caesar and you are saying give it to Caesar because it belongs to him, but give to God that which has the image of God. It always calls back that image. That's what I was talking about yesterday, what I called the spirit yesterday. This image, it always, and, and the book of Psalms, David says, that deep calling for deep. The image of God is calling back. Come back, you belong with me. Like a hand and a glove. We fit together. Without me, there is no peace. Without me, you are nothing. You can only find peace when I fit into the hole that is in your soul. It's, it's me, size, God says. That is your true identity. The spirit with which we call out Abba, Father. That's the purpose for which we are created for. So the battlefield it's no more in heaven, it's not in Iraq, not just on earth, but right in our minds. Friends, I'm home and dry now. I'm home and dry now. You need to guard that mind. You need to guide it. Not that I've already obtained it or I'm already made perfect, but I do it. I press, I pursue, but here's good news. What I'm pursuing has already been found. My idea has been found. I'm only walking from victory to victory. I am not seeking for victory anymore. The victory was won at the cross. So I'm walking from victory to victory, from glory to glory. Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended it. I'm not yet perfect. I'm not what I ought to be. But so long as I've started on the journey, when God looks at me, he doesn't look at where I am. So long as I'm struggling, he doesn't look at where I am. He looks at the finished journey in Jesus. It's, it's more like this in my culture. My little girl who is seven now, when when we go home back to Africa. And this, this disturbs, it, it confuses the daylight out of here. We go back home. The grannies in Zimbabwe, they are called gogos. That's to say grandmother. Now, the old people would say to her, looking at her, she's six years old. They would say, gogo. And then she says, Dad, they are saying I'm an old woman. There is something in the African culture that looks at a child and sees her in a grown stature. Did you get that? She has already everything that is needed in a woman to be a woman. So some of them will call her mama, a small little girl. The reason is they are seeing her for what she will be if she continues growing. So when the heavens look at me still struggling, but so long as I'm in Jesus, hey, I I've con I've don't consider myself to have held it. But this one thing I do, I keep struggling daily, I fall. Though a righteous man falls seven times, yet will he rise up again. I'm still on the game. I'm down, but I'm not out. When God looks at me, he doesn't look at me for where I have fallen he looks at me for what I will be if I keep growing. Because Christ has got hold. But what you must do, fight you must. Walk on you must. Don't keep on fall, falling where you have fallen. Rise up and keep on going. Because God is waiting. You know like we do with little children? I don't know whether you do it here. In my culture we do it when we are teaching children to walk. They sometimes fall. We don't get angry with them when they fall down. We give them another chance. Say, try it again, boy. Let's do it. Let's do it. Come on, stand up. Do it again. That's why that is God with us. That is God with us. 
But let me, let me end at this note. Here is my story. Please don't miss this one. I have permission to share this story with you. Do you see that boy? That handsome boy? That's me in 1984. That's the only picture I could find beyond 1990. I was that age when I was at school one day. Actually, my brother was going away to study. And he left me. I, I took him to the bus stop, carried his bags, and off he went. But just before he left, he gave me a 50 cent coin. Now, remember, with 50 cent coin, I can buy five fudges. So that was a lot of money for me. But if you had a mother like mine, somebody gives you money and you show her, that's the end of it. I don't know whether it was just my mother alone. <laughs> so what I did was, I made sure that my 50 cent coin, I will keep it a secret. So, school came, and my mother was so healthy conscious, she would never give us money to go to school. We would always go to school with peg lunch. Cause so that we don't buy useless things at school. It's only now that my mother is getting right. Then she was so wrong and so mean. Uh, am, am I the only one whose mother gets right as we get older? <laughs> so I went to school that day, and I bought my five fudges. Big pieces like that, five of them. Oh boy, I ate all of them. And boys were looking at me and I was saying to them, I always ask for fudges from you and you don't give me. Now it's my turn to munch them while you are watching. <laughs> so I ate all my fudges. I don't know what happened with the sugar thing that day. So I ate all of them. After lunch break, one of the kids at the back was head crying. I've missed somebody who stolen my 50 cent coin. But Tapio was seen buying with a 50 cent coin. Young man, where did you get the 50 cent coin from? You're with me? Please stay with me with this story. Because I'm going to find out your story too. And um, I said, I brought it with me from home. My class teacher heard that my mother gave me some money. Remember, we are the only shop in the village. So the teacher knows my mother on first name basis. Rides his bike soon after class to my mom. Did you give money to your son? No, I don't give my children money. I pick lunch for them. So, in the teacher's words, he had found his number one rascal suspect guilty. So he comes back the next day and he says, Today we're going to sort this thing, these things out. It was a Methodist primary school, very upholding moral standards, Christian moral standards. We don't want thieves in this school, so young boy, we are going to sort you out. It was during those days when they were allowed to care. So he put the chair like this, and I was supposed to hold over the backrest and touch the other end. And the reason why I was getting it on my backside is because I was insisting that I had not stolen the money. So what he was going to do is, first of all, he was going to beat the lying out of me before he deals with the thieving part. 
Let me tell you that the pain that I felt was not because of the stick. The pain was not on my flesh. It was in my heart as the other school kids shouted thief and liar. I'm only getting to understand that when we look at our children, did you know that children are emotionally mature? They may not be cognitively mature, but emotionally, at 27 weeks in the mother's tummy, they feel the stress and the depression of the mother. So there is such a thing as childhood trauma. We may not register what went wrong with us when we, go, when we grow old, but there is a fingerprint of that trauma in our minds, and we use it to process life in our adulthood. Are you still with me? You're with me. Little did I know the devil was stealing my ID. In 2011, I am mowing the lawns. My wife has planted some beautiful flowers, marigolds, very cheap flowers. They almost grow on their own. If you just put the seeds there, enough rains, marigolds just bloom, if you know what I'm talking about. But there was a um, a bee-like insect that was eating the stem and they were falling off to the ground. In Australia, in February, the temperatures rise up to about 46 degrees. And in the hot sun of February, I'm mowing the lawns and I'm drenched in my sweat. My wife looks through the window, she sees that I'm sweating. She gets a cold glass of water and gives to my daughter to come and give me. She sees the bloom of the flower on the ground and she runs back into the house and says, Mom, Dad is plucking down your flowers. <laughs> and I can see it coming to me. I can feel it. You're with me. I'm beginning to feel my temperature rise. And she comes out with energy. And these are her words. I've just been vulnerable now for the sake of the gospel. I wish I could stand here and tell you that I'm perfect. I'm not. She comes out with energy. If you don't want to mow the lawns, why don't you just leave it instead of plucking down my flowers? This woman has no knowledge of my history, of the golf ball <laughs> that hit me as a child with wrong accusations. That was the end of it. I stopped the lawnmower. And this has happened all the time. I just didn't know it. All the time when I'm wrongfully accused, I've slammed doors. I've done things. I've been aggressive. So I went back into the room, went into my library, and slammed the door and locked myself in there for the next two hours. The devil is smiling. I can see him smiling. There he is using my tools. There he is using my tools. I handed them to him when he was 10 years old. I have a question for you. That was my story. I had to ask my wife to use this story. It has been a long journey of crying with Christ to make me a better husband. I did not realize I was a toxic husband in my, 
in my home. There was a little boy that lived in me because the devil had stolen my ID. That's not what God created me for. The role for which I had been called for as a husband before I'm a pastor at church is to be a gentleman in my home. To be a sweet man in my home. To love my wife is not a response to her submission. No, no, no. It is a command from the master. It is a responsibility whether she submits or not. Because Jesus' wife was talking too much when he was being nailed to the cross. But Jesus says, Father, forgive her, for she doesn't know what she's doing. Or that is the call to submit is not a response to a loving husband. It's a command. It's a command. But the devil has stolen the purpose for our marriages. The children whose ideas have been stolen growing up in homes that are dysfunctional. I was first teaching my son what I didn't realize is I was now handing over tools to my son that this is how you treat women. How has, the do how has the devil stolen your ID? At school, children, every day, their IDs are stolen through bullying. The father decides to leave the home and goes away. Do you realize, and I say this because I know right here, this is where God lingers. So this is holy ground. I need to take off my shoes. I speak to a man who is here, whose children are elsewhere, who are being raised without a father. And I don't speak with any judgment within me. I'm just saying, my brother, God wants to restore the identity. Time has come for us to pursue the true ideals of God. Yes, it may be too late to go back to the mother of those children. But you need, those children need you in their lives for them to be wholesome men and girls. They need the father figure in their lives. Reconnect with them. Or else the devil is using that situation. Are you with me, church? The devil is using that situation to steal an ID out of a young man and a young lady. And I said, I speak. Sometimes it's through the devil crippling us and we remain with bitterness after loss of a limb or something. We get angry. Things are not yet sorted out in our lives. Oh, my friends, I don't know what there is. Pickpockets that the devil uses some things that we've inherited from our families, some things that we've cultivated for ourselves, young people, some of those screens that we stay looking at throughout the night and looking at naked women. It's actually a, a mind that the devil is using to steal his ID from, to steal our ID from. That's not the purpose for which we were created. Are you with me? addictions, depression, and emotional imbalances. Now, I want you to understand there are many reasons for, for depression. I, I, I say this is holy ground. Sometimes there are different reasons why people get into depression. But sometimes it is because of loss of hope, because of a situation, too much stress. We need to put our hope in Jesus. The devil is using them to destroy the image of God. These hubs of the past, bitterness. 
I wish I could tell you about a young boy I looked at one day in a different place. Mother says, Pastor, I want you to pray for my boy. What happened? We separated with the father. Are you with me, church? There's a reason why I'm mentioning this. I don't know who is here. But this is salvation time now. Father went away and he said, I need to go with my son. And he goes with his son. Two years later, the mother is called. The teacher does an investigation and finds the number of the mother. Says, I want you to come from a different city. She goes to that city and says, when you come, come straight to school. Don't let your husband know that you're coming to see me. This is the teacher. And he says, mom, you are so and so's mother. He says, yes. Do you know that your son is not well? No, I have no clue. I've not seen my son in two years. He says, well, I have been noticing for the past few weeks that your son, when he sits on the chair, he sits on the sit on, like on a side. And I asked him why, and he said he's got a lot of wounds on the back. And I said, where are the wounds coming from? The father has been raping the young boy. Pastor, pray for this young boy. You look into the eyes of the young boy, life has been stolen from those eyes. They are telling a story. I don't know who is here. I don't know how the devil has stolen your ID. But perhaps you realize there is some bitterness in your heart. There is someone you have not forgiven. A husband who walked away after messing you up and he just went away. And you remain today, there is some bitterness in your heart. That is not the purpose for which you were created. He never created you to be a bitter woman or a bitter man. Or maybe he even left you with a disease. They don't understand you sometimes when you just lose it. They don't know that that uncle, that creepy uncle, raped you when you were a 10 year old. And they just see your bitterness. The, true, the truth, my friend, is that the devil was dealing you a golf ball. But I have news for you tonight. I have news for you tonight. God says, I know the thoughts I have for you. The thoughts towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts to do what? Of peace and not of evil but to give you an expected end. Now, I need to illustrate this in closing. This text has not been understood sometimes. It's one of the most common quoted texts. God has an expected end for your life. You're with me. But the problem is you are born here. So far away from the expected end. Now hear this matter. This is the conclusion of it now. The way with which we are created, we are born, we are already born disadvantaged. Our birth already is faulty. So it's so far away from the expected end. Now this is what happens. I'm born broken. In sin doth my mother conceive me. Do you know that conception is not birth? Conception happens nine months earlier. 
In sin did my mother conceive me when the two garments met right there when sin was being concocted. I did not need to go to university to qualify as a sinner. By conception, I am a qualified sinner. I'm far away from God's expected end. Then when I came out, it's as if the shower that received me is a shower of abuse and golf balls. A shower of, of a lot of mishaps of me in my life. Father goes away. Wars happen and we see dead bodies as small little boys. And it's as if the journey is no more toward the expected end. It's actually walking towards death. And this is why Paul says, Oh, Father, what wretched man that I am who shall save me from the body of this death. So, Christ comes in. And he says, I have thoughts of peace for you. Only if you can allow me to start this journey with you. Allow me to carry you on my shoulders. I have already got hold of you at the cross. There is a journey we have to walk. If you trust me, we will get you there to the expected end. But even before we get there, when I have you in my arms, when God looks at you, it's as if you are already at the expected end. It's as simple as that. This is the good news of the gospel, my friends. I don't know what your situation is. I need to pray with you tonight. Tonight I need us to get into a season of prayer. I'm finished. I'm finished. There must be something, there could be something I've said today that resonates with you. I don't want to know your story. You don't have to share your story, but we can all come to the altar and speak to the Father. As I tell God my story, you tell yours to him. I don't know of any better way of worship than when sinners come together and take their burdens to Jesus. Where is my friend? Please start playing. Start playing, I surrender all. Is there some things that you are carrying heavy in your heart, some golf balls the devil has dealt you? I invite you, just walk up front. You don't have to share your story with us. You don't have to share your story with us. Because I need him just as much. Just one person. getting an impression. I just wanted to pray like this, but I'm getting this impression in my heart that there could be someone here who was raised in the church. I don't care which church you were raised in the church, but somehow 
because of the golf balls of life, you let go of Christ's life, his hand. And you have not been living with Christ, but you are saying, Christ, I want to reconnect with you. You were raised in the church, but you just let go. If you are here tonight, just raise your hand. I just want to pray with you in mind. May God bless you, my friend. God bless you. May God bless you. May God bless you. Somebody else? Somebody else? Somebody else? You can put your hands down, my friends. Could there be someone else? Could there be someone else tonight? Can I just make another, another, another call? Maybe you are here tonight. You have never really connected with Christ. But you are saying, Pastor, I don't even know how to do this thing. But I feel it in my heart that I need to start a relationship with Christ. If you are here tonight, you don't have to know. Just raise your hand and we'll pray together. May God bless you, my sister. May God bless you. You have not yet started this journey with Christ. Could there be someone else tonight? Could there be someone else tonight? Could there be someone else tonight? Could there be someone else? Just raise your hand. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you tonight. And let us pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you for your intervention just in time. Oh, Father, I wish I could pray for these, but you know how much I need you. I cannot be an intermediator for them because I am in just as much need as them. You know my story. I've shared just a bit, a tiny little bit of my struggles to find your ideal. My friends are here joining me, Father, so we pray together. They are lifting up their hearts to you tonight. Father, they're not looking up to me. I'm not a miracle worker, but we are looking to you, Jesus, the apostle of our covenant. Only you can make us whole, Father. We look up to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Him alone who can restore our ideas, that image of God that was distorted, Father. We are now known as people who are angry. We are now known as people who are bitter. We are now known as people who cannot forgive, but that is not the purpose for which we were created, Father. Oh, Father, as I speak to you tonight, you know the wounds in the hearts of your sons and daughters here. You know, Father, the sufferings of the people here. Oh, today we have come to the Holy Shrine where your children are suffering. You linger right there. So, Father, we stand tonight because we know you are here. We didn't have to be good for you to be here. You are here because you're drawn to us by your love. You love us as broken as we are, Father. We take this opportunity. We take this opportunity, Father, to touch the hem of your garment. For we know when we touch you, we are going to be made whole, Father. Oh, Father, make us whole. Make us whole, Father. Remove the bitterness. Oh, Father, pour oil on our wounds. Oh, Father, it's possible there is a woman who is here, possibly nursing some wounds of abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. Father, I just pray that you may pour your Holy Spirit on those wounds and heal them in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, I'm speaking to someone here. There could be a father whose children, a mother whose children have rebelled, Father. They are living in the world and living a life that is wounding their parents, Father. I'm praying for these parents first, Father, that you may heal them and give them hope, Father. We also pray for the children that have gone astray. Oh, Lord Jesus, go after them. Go after them, Father. It's not too late because you are a God who goes after us when we go astray. Oh, Father, we are also brothers lost at home. We are still at home, but Father, we are just as broken and messed up, Father. We ask you to come into our mercy, Father. Come into our mercy, Father. Your hands, right from the Garden of Eden, when you created us, Father, the mercy that you had to handle to create us, the, the, the clay that you had to handle, Father. Even when we ran away from you, you had to come into our mercy again. Come right now, Father, at Ilford Church. Come and make us whole, Father. 
Oh, Father, I pray for the ministry here. May it be a healing ministry, spiritually and emotionally, Father. Oh, thank you, Father, tonight. We receive your Holy Spirit. We receive your healing. We receive your peace in the name of Jesus. We receive your, your wellness. We receive, Father, your wholeness. For we have prayed, knowing that all power and dominion and authority and honor and glory is all yours. We worship you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you, my friends. God bless you. All right, tomorrow night, tomorrow night, if, if you were planning to miss a day, if you were planning to miss a day, don't let it be tomorrow. Because tomorrow the plot thickens. My friends, I see you are going, but I want to invite you, please grab someone's hand as you come tomorrow. We start again the prayer band at 6.30, 7 o'clock, there will be a video for health. So please do come. May God bless you. May God bless you.